Um, good evening, everyone. It's, it's amazing to be here. I've been listening to all the talks and learning so much from everyone and feel really inspired to, uh, to participate in this event. But I have to admit, I was a little bit puzzled when I was first invited to speak at this panel because I'm not a political scientist, I'm not a politician, I'm not a famous columnist. I'm, I'm, I'm a European citizen, yes, and I'm a, I'm a Polish lassie. Uh, any other Polish people in the room today? Yes? Well, if not, then I'm happy to represent. Um, so, yes, I'm a, I'm a Polish lassie who has made Scotland her home. And thank you. <laughs> and I have also made the Scots language my career. And yes, just to get things straight from the beginning, I did say the Scots language. Everybody is making a little bug today, so, so uh, here is mine. So Scots is not a slang version of English, or a working class dialect, or parliamo glesga. Um, and of course you can pursue a career in Scots, uh, or with Scots in focus, and I hope this is going to be less of a curiosity as new generations of confident Scots learn more about their cultural heritage. I'm a historical linguist, and I'm very proud to be able to teach Scottish and international students about the history of Scots at one of the ancient Scottish universities and be part of a grassroots movement for the official recognition of Scots as a minority language in Scotland. So watch this space, by the way. The Scottish Languages Bill, which the SNP put in their political manifesto, is now being drafted and will, be, will include the first official legal recognition of Scots. But I've been invited here to talk about whether Europe can be complete without Scotland and whether Europeans care about Scotland. In fairness, I represent the largest immigrant section of the Scottish population and in fact the UK population, although the number of Polish people in the UK has gone down after Brexit, as, as Neil has already pointed out. Uh, and we might come back to this issue later in the discussion. So yes, it's great to be given uh, a voice at this impressive event. And because we're sharing stories today, I hope you can indulge me and I would like to share two very contradictory stories with you today because one is about a complete lack of awareness of Scotland and the other one is about how embedded Scotland is in the fabric of Europe and its culture. So the first one is about my aunt being really proud of me when I got a job as a researcher at the University of Edinburgh in 2014, that fateful year. She would tell everybody, oh yes, Johanna is moving to England to pick up an academic post. How are things in England? She would ask me when I came home to visit. So this lack of awareness that there was more to the British Isles than England used to be a frequent scenario. And people in Europe, certainly where I come from, didn't get news about Scotland. And that's a nod to uh, James Robertson reading uh, later on. Scotland wasn't an obvious point of reference when one talked about an English-speaking country. People knew about whiskey and maybe Robert Burns. Some of them watched Braveheart, like myself, at an impressionable age. Maybe that's the, the reason why I ended up here. I don't know, don't laugh. Um, but Great Britain was presented to people uh, like my aunt as a hom homogenous country where everybody spoke English with the BBC accent, shopped at Harrods, and went for a stroll in the Hyde Park. So these were the topics in handbooks teaching, teaching English as a foreign language. That was the gateway into the English-speaking culture. The Union Jack, the London Cab, as well as a tartan tin of shortbread were rolled into one. However, things changed after 2014 and definitely after 2016. Suddenly my family and friends were saying, so what is the Scottish independence thing all about? Aren't you afraid of all these nationalists in Scotland? Because nationalist is a loaded word, and there was a really interesting panel in one of the breakout rooms, and many of you were there, uh, probably, uh, because this is really the, one of the major reasons why Europe needs Scotland. Scotland is a counterbalance to right-wing extremist, chauvinist, xenophobic movements, which have... Ha <laughs> the movements which have hijacked the idea of nationalism and patriotism. Scotland is a beacon of civic nationalism and countries like Poland need your example. So that's my first story. The second one starts with Old Lang Syne. The famous song, which you might be interested to hear, is actually used in Japanese supermarkets at closing time. <laughs> 
as I've recently found out, it was, it was marvelous to hear it. But you know it with Robert Burns' lyrics, and I first learned it, the Polish lyrics, as a girl scout, sitting around the fire with my friends, and I had no idea it was a Scottish song, you know, coming back to my first story. But later, I realized that this is one example of how embedded Scottish influence is uh, in our shared European culture. Polish cities bear marks of Scottish presence from the early modern period on, so that's something that Neil was talking about, you know, Stadyszkoty, Old Scotland is a, is a district in the Hanseatic city of Gdańsk. In my hometown, Leszno, which is in central western Poland, there is a statue of Dr. Jan Johnston, or John Johnson, a second generation Scotopolonus, as he would uh, describe himself, who was a friend of Comenius, an influential early modern thinker. So Scots have shaped our European philosophical, economic, and political thought. We need the intellectual input of Scotland in today's Europe, and European partners need to be able to send students on an Erasmus exchange and to collaborate on research projects with Scottish academics. Scottish students should have the right to follow in the footsteps of the generations of Scots who studied in Padua, Utrecht, Paris, Geneva in the early modern period, and Tom Nairn. Uh, And, and Tom Nairn, who, who is our um, figure in, this, in the central of, of this uh, gathering today. So every time I go back to Poland, I'm astonished at how the country is changing and has changed uh, because of our recovered European links and our place at the decision table. I think Scotland deserves a place at that table too, and we will all be better off with the Scottish voice speaking its own right on the European stage. Thank you very much.